uh, in church worlds today, we expect Jesus to do everything. We expect Jesus to bring the sinner in, to save the sinner. We expect Jesus to do everything, which I understand. God wants us to rely on Jesus. God wants us to rely on him for everything we have. But that is not absent of our service. God wants to be involved. The Bible says God goes through the earth searching to and fro, looking for those he can show himself strong in. God is strong by himself. Amen. God really doesn't need our help. God wants our help. There's a difference in needing and wanting. A need is something you have to have. A want is a desire. God desires us to work hand in hand with him to make a difference in our world. Last week we covered one of the, if we're going to be a servant, one of the most important things we have to have is faith. And not just little faith, but big, big faith. Big thoughts, big ideas, faith that moves mountains, faith that's big enough to let God in. Amen. And we talked about that last week. Today we're going to take step two of how we can get involved so that we can stand hand in hand with Christ. Christ has the power to save. Christ has the power to deliver. But you and I have the power to bring and to be servants and to help Christ in this effort. And I want to be involved in that, and I know you do as well. So now we're going to take step two. Step two of what we have to do. Today we're going to talk about this. We must become spiritual contributors. We must become spiritual contributors. We have a lot of spiritual consumers. So what does that mean to be a spiritual consumer? What that means is there's a lot of people that come to church to soak up the good. And that's great. That's fine. They come to church. They sit under a message. They sit under praise and worship. They go through Sunday school, whatever other programs they have. They come to consume. What is in it for me? What can I get out of that? That has its place. Everybody needs their time at the feet of Jesus to soak up Jesus. I'm not knocking that. But there comes a time if we're going to be servants of God, we have to actually become spiritual contributors. Meaning we've got to actually invest back in. We can't simply consume. We, it's hard for us as Americans because we're set up as consumers in our country. We are, our economy is set up to consume. If you remember way back when, after 9-11... George W. got on the thing, and he got on the TV, and he said, "Hey, don't stop shopping. Keep going to the mall. Keep going, spending, do things." Because they didn't want the economy to collapse. Everybody get scared. Everybody hold on to their money. The Dow begins to fall. Everything begins to collapse. He wanted us to spend. That's why, also in the government, if the economy's going bad, what they do, they put out a stimulus. Everybody gets a check in the mail to stimulate the economy to get out and consume. That's the way the world's economy works. God's economy does not work like that. God's economy wants you to sow. God wants you to be a contributor into the kingdom. Therefore, you can reap. Therefore, you can reap the benefits of it. This is where we're going to go this morning in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, if you have your Bible. John chapter 4, verse 31. Let me set the scene before I begin reading. This is when Jesus was on his way uh, and with the woman at, at the well in Samaria. He had to go there. He had to meet this woman. And he said, I had to go and he had to sit down. And his disciples were hungry. <laughs> so they went off to eat. They went off to eat. And Jesus, they come back and Jesus begins to talk to them. John chapter 4 verse 31 it says, Meanwhile his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. There has to be a contributor. There always will be consumers. There will always be some that will consume. Meaning, I need a blessing, I need a blessing, I need a blessing. And yes, Jesus does provide those blessings. I need healing. Jesus provides healing. We need salvation. Jesus provides that. We need peace. Jesus su supplies all of those things. But there comes a time where we have to be contributors. And what <coughs> happened in this moment, the disciples were thinking, of course, with their flesh, uh, as they tend to do. And they were saying, man, I'm hungry, i got to go eat. Jesus said, there's something else I have to do. I'm not here just to consume. I'm not here just to be fed. I'm here to contribute something into the kingdom. And there's more that I can get out of contributing than I can get out of this carnal thing. The mindset of being a spiritual contributor is the fact that you have to stop at some point being a world consumer to be a spiritual cons contributor. Does that make sense? If all you consume is the world, and by that I mean 
All week long, you watch TV, you talk to your buddies, you talk to your friends, you go out places, you take trips, you do everything. Not one time do you pray, you read your Bible, you, you think of someone, you, you, you intercede for someone, you spread the gospel, you witness to someone. Then what happens is you become so consumed by the things of the world and the things that you're consuming that you can't contribute spiritually because you have nothing to give. You can't give what you don't have. There has to come a time where you... You gain from God, but then you contribute back into the kingdom. It'll make more sense as we go. We are not called to be spiritual consumers. We are called to be spiritual contributors. Contributors. The church does not exist for us. Mind blown. The church does not exist for us. What we're doing this morning isn't for us. It's for the world. The church exists for the world. That's why Jesus created it. What we've turned the church into is a hobby. Is a social club. It's somewhere we go to make connections. That's not what the church is supposed to be. Jesus placed the church to be witnesses unto him. If you go back to the birth of the church in Acts, Jesus said, go, wait for power to come from on high, and then go be witnesses unto me. He didn't say, okay, and then set up shop, meet every week, chew the fat, pray that I bless you, get rich, make good friends, and go home. That's not what he said. He said, go establish yourselves, become a body, and then be witnesses unto me. Be contributors into my work and what I'm doing. When the church sits down and creates this thing of modern day church of where it's all about us and it's not about God and it's not about the hurting or the loss. It's about us being fed. I hear that all the time. I want to be fed. I want to be fed. I can take you and put you in McDonald's where they got tons of food. But unless you go and buy it, you're going to die of starvation. Just coming to the place doesn't feed you. I wish I'd be fed. There comes a time where, and I say it this way, babies need to be fed. Because you know why? Babies can't feed themselves. Amen. So if you've been coming to church for 30, 40 years and you're still in the boat of, i got to get fed. No, you're still an infant in the Lord. You need to grow up and eat. Develop a life and for it. Bible study. Go. I understand we all like a good meal every now and again. But every day you need to feed your spirit. Why? So that you can be a contributor. And not just be a consumer. Okay. So the church exists for the world. God never meant the church to be a building. We say, and I'm not knocking the vernacular. I'd say it too. We're going to church. But understand, this is just a building. It's just wood, it's just plaster, it's carpet. Is it sanctified? Yes, because we set it apart for the master's use. But understand, the construction of this building is no different than the construction of any other building. It's just a building. Coming to this place doesn't do you any good if you're not getting something from it and giving back to it. That's what the church is. That's what the church body is. The church isn't a building. The church is the people. You are the Northgate Church of God, not this building. Amen. You. You. So the building of our parameter of how far we can reach is how far you go in a day. Of how far your life takes you. Where your life takes you. Where it goes. This is just the center where we come to meet. We come to celebrate Jesus. We come to get revived. We come to get refreshed, filled back up so we can go back out and contribute. So we can go back out and win more people and, and save more people and bring more people to Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. But we are the Northgate Church of God. If you are in the concept of this is where the church is, then you're not living what we're supposed to be living. We're supposed to be saying, I'm the church. This is just where we congregate. I'm the church. I'm the one that's called to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. So we don't go to church. We are the church. And again, I'm not going to knock you. I say it too. I tell my kids it's time to go to church. I'm not sinning. You can still say that stuff. <laughs> God isn't going to get mad at you. We get the point. What I'm saying is we've got to grasp the concept that we are the church. That we are the body of Christ. That it's not a building that we attend. Because there's a lot of people who, if you ask them, and, and if you can even test this theory, if you ask them, hey, are you saved? They won't tell you, yes, I know Jesus Christ. They'll say, I go to this church. So they'll say, do you know Jesus Christ? Oh, yeah, I go to that church down the road. If that's what it is, you need to follow that up and say, I didn't ask you where you go to church. I asked you, do you know Jesus? Amen. Amen. Do you know the Lord? Because you can go to every church that's in Victoria and die and go to hell. 
Unless you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's all for nothing. So there's a difference in people who go to church and there's people who are the church. When you are the church and someone asks you, are you saved? You say, yes, I am. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. And then later on you want to ask me where I attend and where I celebrate my Jesus? I'll tell you, it's at Northgate Church of God. I go there and I celebrate with the people there, my brothers and sisters. We celebrate Jesus every Sunday and every Wednesday. We get together and we glorify Him because it's about Him, not about us. Amen. God calls everyone to serve in his church. Everyone. God does not call specific people. This is how we're becoming servants. Remember, this is how we become Jesus and we. This is how we help Jesus. By understanding you have a calling on your life. You have something to do in the kingdom of God. You may never stand where I'm standing and deliver a message like I deliver it. I'm doing what I'm called to do. But everybody has a calling. God has no callings to just set up shop and attend for a few hours a week and go home. That is not a calling. There's no calling of that. No one's called to be a spectator in the kingdom of God. No, everybody is called to service. Everybody has something to do, something to, to have there. Do you realize that if, even if you go to the Old Testament, if you go to the Old Testament when they had to the, the, build the temple... God didn't say, okay, I need a couple of good guys to run the temple. No. He said, I need a whole body of people, a whole tribe, the Levites, to do what the temple is supposed to do. You're to live in the temple, breathe the temple. You're to know the temple. You're to do sacrifices. Now, I understand there's a lot of more work to do back then because of the sacrifice and the physical part of it. But even God, when he created this, he said, this is calling for a mass amount of people to make this work. Not just one pastor, one teacher, one person over this ministry, one person over that ministry. No, it takes a whole bunch of people. The reason why we've lost the concept in the church is because it's easier to hire people to do what we're called to do. Amen. Outsourcing, I think, is what it's called. The church is full of outsourcers. You say, what do you mean? I'm not a real good praying person, so I'll tell pastor to pray about it. You know what you've done? You've just outsourced your calling. And you said, you're supposed to do this. Well, I really need to witness. I feel like I need to talk to them, but I really don't know what to say. Let me call pastor. Pastor, will you talk to them? You just outsourced your calling to me. That's not what God said. God did not say, find a really good person and have them do everything. I'm not saying I'm a really good person, so... I hope I am. But God didn't call us to do that. God called you to do your work and me to do mine. And if we do it hand in hand and do it together, then the body of Christ grows. Then we reach more people. Then more people come to Jesus Christ. But if we out keep on outsourcing our calling to every other person and say, well, I can't do this. I'm do it. I really don't. The Bible, I read the Bible. It don't make sense to me. So you know what? I'm just going to take Pastor's word for it. I'll just believe anything he says. And I, he can read it and he can study it for me. No, you just outsource your calling to me. You have to do this stuff for yourself if you're going to be a contributor in the kingdom of God. Now, you can gain from other people. Like, I can sit down and have a conversation with another minister of the gospel, and I can glean thoughts and perspective from him that I haven't received yet, and I'm getting fed. I'm like, wow, that's a good point. I never saw it that way. And I can add that to my repertoire. There's nothing wrong with that. But I can't sit down and say, I'm not going to do nothing. Everybody else do it. I'm just going to sit down and watch it go. No, you're not living up to what you could be in the kingdom. And when that happens, all of a sudden, the body isn't as functioning or isn't as as Functioning as well as it could. you got to look at it just like the Bible tells us we're the body of Christ in a physical way. You'd be in a pickle if the whole left side of your body decided, I'm not going to do anything today. Right leg, you got it off. you got to get us around. Now, in, in the medical term, you call that a stroke. Where half the body just shuts down. And, and you can tell. Physically, by watching someone who's ever had a stroke, if you've ever had a loved one suffer a stroke before, and you see what it does to their body, it's hard for them to function. They can't do what they could do. The tasks that take us easy because we've got two hands, two feet to do in a matter of minute, it takes them longer time to get it accomplished. What happens in the church world when half of the body is suffering atrophy because it's not moved in 20 years? It's just come to church, sit on the pew, said amen, and went home. And the rest of the body is trying to win the loss, trying to reach the people, and they're just dragging the rest of us. 
The body of Christ can't function the way it could because all of a sudden half of it said, we're not going to contribute, we're just going to consume. Any gardeners out there? Anybody know? I'm not. I'll kill whatever plant you give me. I won't try to, but it will. It will happen. I just don't have it in me. I don't have that gene, whatever it is, to keep it alive. I don't have it. But I do know enough of it, I've studied enough to know there's such a thing called sucker branches. And if you've got a sucker branch, it means it's sucking all the life and not, none of the other things are producing because it's sucking all the life. It's green and everything, but in order for the thing to really grow, you've got to cut that off so all the sources can go where it's supposed to and you can produce fruit. Here's the thing, and don't get offended with it. The church as a mass in America has a ton of sucker branches. They attach themselves every week. I like this, I like this, I like that. Man, I like that program, I like that program. Hey, would you like to help us? No, 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 no. You do it. That is, that's not me. I'm not called to do that. What is your calling? <laughs> Tell me, because I've been looking for it. What, is, what are you called to do? There comes a time we've got to step up, especially if we're going to beat Jesus and we. So everybody, everybody, if you're breathing this morning, if you're watching on Facebook and you're breathing this morning, you've got something to do in the church. Something. There's, we've got tons of stuff to do. Romans 12, 6 and 8. Let me put it this way to you. Romans 12, 6 and 8. The Bible says this. It says, in his grace, it's talking about God, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If, you, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Man, that's a lot of stuff. There's seven of them, and there's a reason. God doesn't give lists list for no reason. Everything God gives us is for edification, correction, so that we can be fed in the Word of God. This is what it means to be a servant in the house of God. These seven things, I'm going to read to you, serving, teaching, encouragement, giving, leadership, kindness, prophecy. Everybody is called to be involved in these in some way or form, capacity. Say, what do you mean? In serving. Serving what? Serving is what I would consider behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. You're not going to be on the platform. No one's going to see you up here. No one's going to see you behind the lectern. No one's going to see you on, you know, on the ad or whatever it is. No, you're not going to be there. You're going to be the person behind it. You're going to be the person that, that comes and makes sure the chairs are in order. You're going to make sure that there's no, there's no trash. You're going to make sure that there, there's plenty of places to park in the parking lot. There's going to be someone at the door. You're going to be the unseen thing. But that is important in the kingdom of God. The problem is everybody wants to be a superstar. They don't want to do anything, but if they do want something, they want to be the superstar. They want to be, in the, fa they want to be the face of the thing. They want to be it all. You can't do that. There has to be a servant's heart. There has to be a servant. And you can't get here unless you begin somewhere as servant. You got to start somewhere. God didn't just I did, God didn't just save me and the next day I was pastor in a church. That's not the way it went. I had to serve and, and be youth helper. I had to be church cleaner. I had to be gopher. You go and get whatever the church wants you to get. You got to do whatever the pastor says. I yeah, there was times I wanted to quit. I was like, man, this is horrible. I, when do I get to do what they're doing? But I had to learn how to serve before I could contribute. And in serving, I'm contributing. Amen. It's amazing how it works. So, serving, teaching. You say, oh, okay, well, I'm going to just start teaching ministry. No. Just because you're called to teach doesn't mean that you're called to teach every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You're called to teach what you know to other believers. You don't need a platform to do that. All you need to be is in the vicinity of other people to teach them something. I see you're struggling. Hey, I heard your testimony. You were struggling. I was struggling with that. Let me teach you what the Lord taught me. This is the body functioning together. This is the body helping, helping each other, coming together, making the body stronger. If you, have, if you see me suffering for something you've already overcame and you don't speak up to help me, then, then you might as well just punch me in the face. 
If you know how to get a hold and get through or get through that valley, get through that storm, if God's helped you, you don't have to have a class. you just got to step up to the plate and say, hey, I saw you struggling, and I want to share what I have for you. God taught me this. I learned this in my valley. I learned this in my storm. I learned this up my mountain, and maybe it will help you along the way. And when we share that stuff together, we all become stronger, and the body of Christ grows. Amen. It's amazing. Encouragement. Now, we've got some of the people that are called the, the discouragement ministry, which does not exist. Well, I don't know. They're excited, but who knows if that's going to work. I, uh, three pastors ago, they tried that, and it didn't work then, and I doubt it'll work now. No one's called to that ministry. If that's your ministry, retire today, hang it up. But you are called to encourage one another. To encourage one another. To lift each other up. To be encouraging. You don't have to have a, a title by your name to be an encourager. Just do it. Just go out there and encourage people. Hey, you know what? It's going to get better. Put your faith in Jesus. I guarantee you, God's got something great for you. There's things you can tell people all day long that are biblically true. I don't care if they're out there and they're the worst sinner in the world and they're just knocking every sin off the list one by one. You can still say, hey, you know what? God loves you. God's got a plan for your life. And you didn't lie one time. God does love you. God does have a plan for your life. There's so many good things God can do with you. There's so many talents and abilities that you don't even know. There's a whole new life for you hidden in Jesus Christ. Man, you can rock this world for Christ. You didn't lie. And then not one time. You told them the gospel truth. Because that's God's plan for us. Giving. Now, I'm not talking just about finances. Yes, so people who are blessed to give financially, that's awesome they can but to be a giver is not just about finances. It's about everything in your life. To just be someone who gives. Not to be, be someone who actually deposits in people and not constantly withdraws from people. Don't be a user of people. Be someone who actually deposits into people. Be somebody who encourages. Be somebody who gives. Gives a little extra time. Gives a little hope. Gives a hug when they need it. Gives them a shoulder to cry on when they need it. That's things that are ministries in the body of Christ that make the body of Christ stronger. It helps us to ha help Jesus. Leadership. There are some people who are called to lead. They're just leaders. They're take control type of people. It's in their DNA. You ever been one? Uh, and usually we call them bossy. Well, you want to boss everything. I ask you for your help, and now you're over here making plans, running the show. We usually get mad. Don't get mad at them. A lot of times it's in their DNA. It's what they are. They just see a project and they're like, okay, this is what we got to do. Here, 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 and get it organized. And we may not like them. They're like, literally, they just want to do everything. They just want to know. That's in their DNA. And then you've got some people who are just servants. They come together and be like, what do you need me to do? I'm here to do whatever you want. They never say, they, ne they just say, whatever you tell me, that's what I'll do. Both are important in the kingdom of God because both of them require uh, important things for the body to grow up. You gotta have leadership, you gotta have servants. You gotta have both. You can be a contributor if you know how to put a plan together, work that plan, do it. Don't just keep it for yourself. Bring it to the church. Bring it, bring it, and, and let us let us help what God has given you apply to the ministry. Man, I, I can do this. Be a leader. Be a leader. Do what you're called to do. Kindness. Now we shouldn't have to tell everybody you're called to be kind, but you are. You're called to be kind. God has no people, He's called to be rude. Amen. Some saints think they are, but they're not. And I'm going to give you some pointers. If you've ever said, well, I just speak my mind. The Bible calls you a fool. Not pastor. Bible. That's just who I am. Well, you need to be changed then. Amen. Amen. The Bible says a fool speaks his mind. That's, that's the book of Proverbs. I didn't make that up. Go read it. A fool speaks their mind. If I said everything that pops up in here, you'd fire me. You'd be like, we don't need that joker up here. But I have to take what pops in here and bring it under the subjection of Jesus Christ. Amen. You'd be like, whoa, that's a crazy thought. Lord, get a hold of that one before it goes anywhere. And bring it back under me. Bring it back here to where I got control. Guys, that's the reality of what it means to serve. That's what it means to be a servant. But you're called to be kind. To be kind to one another. To be kind. It's a calling. It's like, and here's the last one. Prophecy. And I know I've got to hurry, but prophecy. It's very important. And when I say prophecy, I don't mean lay hands on people and tell them they're going to Africa, Europe, Indonesia, whatever. No. 
Prophecy is not foretelling the truth, foretelling the future. It is foretelling the gospel. That's what prophecy is. That's the meaning of it. prophecy. Now, is there times when God reveals what's going to happen? Yes, that, that, those are prophets. But let me tell you, if you're in that ball game, you got a hundred percent right. Because the Bible says, if you miss it once, you should be stoned. And I don't mean smoked out of your mind stoned. I mean rock kill you stoned. So you can't be like, well, I'm batting about 300 as a prophet. No, you're a liar, and you get lucky sometimes. Yeah. Amen. Right. Now, I can forth tell the gospel anytime I want. Right. So what does that mean? I can say, the Bible says this will happen in the future. Right. Yes, it's prophecy. I'm not prophesying it. I didn't pick it out of the clouds. God didn't whisper a secret in my ear. He told the whole world. It's in the book. I can say, this is what the Bible says will happen. The Bible says this will happen. The Bible says if we do this, God will do that. And God says if he does this, we can count on this. I can say that all day long. And I'm not called just to be a prophet. Everybody's called to be a prophet. We're a Pentecostal church. We believe in the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Even Paul said, listen, he's like, there's a lot of stuff. Speaking in tongues, all this stuff. He said, but if you want to covet the best gift, he's like, prophesy. What is, he, what is he talking about? Not telling the future, not reading palms, not reading your horoscope, telling you what's going to happen tomorrow. No, that's all devilish. What he was saying is if you can speak the word of God to someone, it can change their life. And everybody's called to do that. Not just pastors or preachers. Matthew 5, 14, 16, we've heard this before many times. You are the light of the world. You. You. You can put your name right there. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it in a, in a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Notice what they said, what God said they'll see in you. Your good deeds. Not your good reputation. Not your good record. Your good deeds. And they'll glorify your Father, which is in heaven. In order to do a good deed means you can't be a consumer. You've got to be a contributor. You have to actually do something. It's a connotation of actually putting something into action to do something good. To do a good deed. And if you say, well, I've done my good deed for the day. I came to church. No, no, no. You can't use that as a good deed. Coming to Jesus Christ, that's obedience. That, that, that's great. And I'm glad you're here. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm downplaying church attendance. No, you do need to be here. We celebrate Christ here. That's an amazing thing to do. I mentioned that in Sunday school too. When I, when I talked about, it, you know, if I was having a birthday and my own kids and wife said, we're too busy to come, you would think, man, that's a horrible family. Not even showing up for his birthday. There's a lot of people who won't show up to church. Say they love Jesus over the moon and back, but don't get up and come to church. This is a place we celebrate him. This is a place we glorify him. This is a place where he's on display that we can come and say with all of our friends of like faith, Jesus, you're awesome. I want, I want to do that. And they're like, I can't wait to get to heaven and shout around the throne. But they can't roll out of bed and do it on a Sunday. Come on now. I can't wait to get to glory and just praise Jesus all day long. But can't do it on a Sunday because I'm too tired. Can't do it on a Wednesday because I'm too busy. Can't do it on here, but man, I can't wait to do it for all eternity. If you can't do it twice a week, what are you looking forward to eternity for? Amen? Does that not make sense to anybody? Be a contributor. Be somebody who contributes to the kingdom of God. Do good deeds. Find things to do for the Lord and do them. And don't wait for everybody. Again, don't outsource what God's put on your heart to do. There's so many ministries that can be started. And right here in this church, there's so many ministries. I've said for years, if my ministry is the only ministry in the church, we're in trouble. We're going downhill and we're sinking fast. Because God's called everybody to some ministry somewhere. Now, I don't mean you're going to go start your own church. I mean within the walls, or within the confines of the structure of the body of Christ, there's ministries. I don't know how many times people, God lays ministries on their heart. You know what? Pastor, what ministry we really need? We need this ministry. We're like, well, that's awesome. The Lord laid it on our heart. Do you want to get it started? No. No, but we need it. 
Why don't you do it, Pastor? Because I got busy doing my stuff. If God put it on your heart, maybe he's calling you to it. Mind blown. Maybe he's calling you to it. Maybe if you're like, and, 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 and I say this not just for our local church. I mean from churches all around the world. And if you've ever been in a pastor or been in a leadership place, you understand what I'm saying. Everybody's got ideas of how to make things better, how to do it, how to make it work, how to do things this way. But then when you say, hey, okay, that's awesome. God gave that idea. Can you help me with it? No, 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 no. I just want to tell you how to do it better. And I'm going to go on my way. No, that's your opportunity to step in and do a good work. And God will give you a reward for it. Your family. Acts 4, 33 and 34 says this. And God's grace, this is when he's talking about the church. When the church all came together in Acts, this is what happened. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, all that there were, they, excuse, all of them that were there were, had no needy person among them. No needy person among them. That was the early church. The early church, when God started, it says, you know what, there was no needy person. Now, they did a little things different back then because they were established in the movement. They came and they sold all their stuff and they pulled all the money together and they kind of distributed the wealth and distributed the, the needs of the people to do things like that. That's not what we're called to do right now. But understand, needy is not just finances. Needy is not just something. There's our people who need love. There's people who need peace. There's people who need encouragement. There's people who need to overcome some demons and some trials. There's people who need a shoulder to cry on. There's people who need counseling, who need advice. We are here to meet those needs. But it can't fall on one or two people. It has to fall on the whole body of Christ. Because when the whole body gets involved, the more needs we meet. And the fact that we meet their needs, then all of a sudden we can enlist them and say, okay, God helped you meet your need. Now, take what you've learned and help someone else. That's the way the church grows. That's the way it happens. Here's some goals, and I'm coming to a close. These are my clubs. Sister, uh, sister can you come play for me? These are just some one-line statements that, that, that I thought of, and I wanted to put them down. And I hope they grab your heart, because this is the goal of what I want my vision of Northgate to be. What kind of church I want us to become. And I hope you agree with this. Spiritual contribution goal. Number one, we want a church where people give more than they receive. Where people give more than they receive. And I don't mean just in the offering plate. I mean of themselves. When we come through those doors and we've got one mission, I want to give of myself. Not to pastor, not to Northgate, but to God. I want to give myself over to God today. I want to make sure he gets all the glory and all the praise. I want to make sure that if there is a sinner, someone who's hurting, someone who's broken, someone who's bound, that strolls in this building today, that I'm not going to be sitting on the sideline while they're over there drowning. I'm going to be the lifeline. I'm going to do my part to drag them to the shore, to drag them to Jesus, to get them to Jesus. I'm going to do that. And if that means that I don't get what I necessarily need today, that's fine because I'm already saved. I'm of the 99. I'm serving a shepherd who told me he was leave the 99 to go get the one. That's the kind of person I want us to be. That's the kind of church I want us to be. Maybe, maybe you may have to volunteer to work children's church. And you say, well, I hate kids. Well, guess what? You're saved. You're redeemed. You know all this stuff. But there might be a mama who needs Jesus that's him here and she needs a little bit of time to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So maybe you can sacrifice what you need and get something for them. I'll be here next Sunday. I'll be here the Sunday after. You can watch it on Facebook later. You don't have to be involved in every little thing. There's sometimes you say, you know what? I'll sacrifice. I'll go help, but I'll go do this while somebody else gets what they need. I want us to be a church like that. I want us to be a church where people serve more than they're being served. Where we come in every morning thinking, how can I serve? What can I do? What can I do? Instead of just rushing in to find our spot and to find our spot here so nobody takes it. No. We're missing. We're putting all of it on Jesus. Let's come in and ready to serve God. I want a church that's passionate about reaching the lost. Gosh. Passionate about reaching the lost. You wouldn't think that I would have to be an emphasis in today's church, but it is. It is. There are people dying and going to hell every second. Every second. I want you to be passionate. 
I want you to say, Pastor, it don't matter what we got to do. But let's get them to Jesus. Let's get them to Jesus. They're broken. They're messed up. They stink. They don't have the right clothes. They don't have the right language. They don't have the right demeanor. They may not fit into what we've got going right now at North K, but they fit into the kingdom of God. They're people and they're souls, and they need us, desperately need us. I've prayed for years, and it's so cool. You know what's cool when God answers your prayer? I've, I've been your pastor for four years, and I've prayed almost every day. God, send us the hurting. Send us the broken. Send us those who need Jesus desperately. And it took three years of praying that until you showed up. And said, let me tell you about this thing called Celebrate Recovery that brings the broken to your door. That brings the ones that the, the society says, oh, they're the scum. They're the rejects. They're the ones. You know why I love those people? Because I was one of those people. I was the alcoholic. I was the druggie. I was the person who, when I walked down the street, people went to the other side. He's like, that dude's bad news. And here I am preaching the gospel. I know this stuff works. I know Jesus is real. I know God can set him on the right path. But man, I want us to have a church that's passionate about lost people. I would love for our church to have a goal that every time we meet, we've got more lost people in the house than we got saved ones. Boy, wouldn't that be an awesome church? Wouldn't that be a church where Jesus is in the middle of it? I am tell you, Jesus is the shepherd who leaves the 99 because he knows they're protected and they're unified together to go find that one lost. I want that. I want a church that doesn't judge those without Jesus but will love them into the family of God. That looks at them and says, boy, they look rough. But man, Jesus knows how to take the roughest of people and clean them up. He knows how to do it. He knows how to do it. He did it for me. Now, I was raised in church. My dad was a pastor. I was drugged to church my whole childhood. But when I got on my own, I was like, I'm done with this mess. I ain't hitting the church. I ain't doing it. I'm hitting the bars. I'm hitting the clubs. I'm doing whatever I can. I'm getting high. I'm getting drunk. I'm doing whatever I can in the world. And I did it. I went full bore out of the world. And when I got saved, that was back when it was cool to sag your pants down and show your underwear and be all thuggish. You remember those days. Maybe you don't, but I do. That's how I came into church that morning. Thuggish, pregnant girlfriend, not married. Hair, crazy, looked rough, mean. God loved me. And the people of that church looked at me and they didn't say, my goodness, look at him. It's like, you know what? Today, God's going to do something special. God's going to help that boy. And now here I am. I know it works. And last but not least, this is what I want. I want our church where everyone uses their gifts in the church to equip the body of Christ and to be the light of the world. You don't have to be the best at something. I'm not the best at anything. I try my best. But I'm not the best. There's better preachers. There's better speakers. There's better leaders. There's better. There's always going to be someone that does it better. And I'm fine with that. Praise God that there are people that do it better than me. That's great. But I'm called to do my best. I'm called to do my best. And when I do my best, my father is pleased. He doesn't measure me up to somebody else. He doesn't say, boy, man... Chad, that guy down the street could have preached that message way better than you did. I never hear that from him. I never hear him say, out of all the preachers I've called, you were the lowest ranked. I've never heard that from him. Never heard it. But every time I've done anything for him, he's told me, good job. You did your best. Because all God's looking for me is for it to try. That's it. He's not asking me for my ability. He's asking me for my availability. Can you do this? If you step up to do it, God will do the things you can't do. God will bridge the gap. That's what Jesus is great at. He's great at bridging the gap. 
He did it between God and mankind. He did it between righteousness and sin. He can do it between where you come up short and what he needs. He can bridge the gap. I promise you he can. I want to tell you one little thing that I heard a minister tell me one time. It changed my whole world. And I hope it changes yours. And I've thought about this the whole time I've done ministry. It's got me as far as I've gotten. He was talking about it. He said, you know what? If God's got a refrigerator, refrigerator in heaven, just like you've got a refrigerator at your house, and if you've got kids, when that kid comes in and you maybe have a teenager that's 18, and he's sitting there and he's doodling something, and it draws something, and it looks like a masterpiece, you're like, ooh, that's awesome. That looks just like what you were trying to draw. You put it up on there, and you say, you know what? That's an awesome picture. But if you've also got a nine-year-old in the house, and he can't finally make it into the lines, his painting is all over his, and he's got to take 20 minutes to explain to you what he drew, but he drew it for you. You know where you put it? Right next to the masterpiece of the older son. Why? Because you're a loving father. And it doesn't matter what it looks like. It just matters that they did it for you. Everything you do for God is refrigerated material. Every little thing. Even if you give a glass of water in Jesus' name, it's going up on the fridge. That was a perfect picture of what I called them to do. I told them to love people and they're out there doing it. They're loving people. That one goes up on the fridge. You know what? This guy over here, he didn't just give a water. He gave 50,000 gallons. He put a well in a place that we needed it. You know what? We're putting that right up next to Chad's glass of water. That's how God operates. There is no beginning. There is no end. The first will be last and the last will be first. When you do something for God... It's refrigerator material. And I've kept that concept my whole life. And I say, God, I don't know. If I'm preaching to 20 or 2,000, I'll preach with the same tenacity. I'll put the same amount of pre preparation. I'll give you my best every time. That I can get up the bat, I'm going to swing. Because this isn't for the people that are here. This isn't just for them. This is for him. We're doing what we do here for him. An audience of one Amen. is what we do here. And everything we do, refrigerator material. Think about that the next time you're like, well, I don't know if I can do it. And little old me, what can I do? No, do something. Be a, be a contributor. Don't just be a consumer. Contribute something and watch God slap it on the refrigerator in glory. And when you get to heaven one day, he's going to say, you see that over there? That's all the stuff you did for me. Here's a crown. Well done. Well done. That's going to be an amazing moment. It's going to make it worth it. Let's bow our heads today. Every head bow, every eye closed. No one looking around. I want to challenge you today, and I want to ask you this morning, because I, nobody knows but you, are you a consumer or are you a contributor? And maybe you say, well, yes, I am a contributor, but are you contributing everything you could contribute? Or are you holding a little bit back? Because I'm just asking you to give your best. Your best may never measure up to anybody else's, but I don't care about other people. I'm talking to you, your best. If you give your best, I promise you, God will use it to build the kingdom of God right here at Northgate. To build the kingdom of God, to see souls set free, to see the lost redeemed, because that's what it's all about, getting people to Jesus. I don't care how, anything short of sin, I don't care what we got to do, but I want them to get to Jesus. I want him to be at Jesus. Because if I can get him to him, he can redeem him. He can save him. That means I've got to tear off some roofs sometimes. Lower some people down to him. That's fine. It means I've got to make a mess a time or two. But you know what? If I can get him to him, that's fine. It means I've got to push through the crowd sometimes just to touch the end of his garment. But I'll do it because I need it. There comes a time where you've got to say, you know what? It's all or nothing. We're living in that day. The Bible says there's coming a time where no man can work. And we're on the cups of it. We're on the very edge of it. Let's do what we do quickly because the kingdom of God's at hand. Amen. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I want to be a contributor. I want to be a contributor. I don't want to be a consumer. I want to serve more than I'm being served. I want to invest more than I'm giving. And right where you are, real quickly, just raise your hand and put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. Thank you. Thank you. God 
sees what you did, and he's going to expect it of you now. He's going to expect it. The next opportunity you have, he's going to expect, okay, you said you want to be a contributor. Here you go. Here's how you do it. Don't turn it down. Take that step of faith. Walk through that door and watch God begin to move in your life and in the lives of others. It's going to be a glorious moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your truth, for your spirit. God, we just ask you that you would help us to be contributors. God, that we would contribute to the kingdom of God, that we would invest of ourselves in your kingdom. God, that we wouldn't hold nothing back, that we would try our best to get every person we know that's lost to get them to you, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, Lord. Put that passion in our heart. Put that in our mind. Let us become the church you want us to be. The church that you died for. The church you're coming back for. God, that's the kind of church we want here at Northgate. God, we just want to please you above all things. Your pleasure comes first and all others come second. We want you to be pleased. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everyone said amen and amen. amen. Guys, we're halfway through. we got two more of Jesus and we. We've got two more services. Bring somebody with you. Bring somebody. Let them know there's stuff to do. There's stuff that we can do to help Jesus Christ, to help the cause of Christ. And you may say, well, Jesus doesn't need our help. No, it's not about need. It's about desire. <coughs> Jesus desires our help. He wants our help. Jesus didn't need help carrying his cross, but he fell and someone else carried it for him a little bit. Why did that happen? Was it because Jesus was too weak? Was it because he needed a break? No, he was the Lamb of God. He knew. It was to teach us a lesson that sometimes Jesus just wants you to get involved, not because you're going to make or break the mission, just because so you can know what it's like to serve along shoulder to shoulder with the Son of God. And I'm telling you, it's a glorious feeling. It's a glorious feeling when you see someone God has redeemed and you just had a little part in it. Not a great big part, just a little part to say, you know what? They came to Christ, and I didn't do nothing but greet them out the door with a smile. But I invested at least something into it. I'm telling you, that's going to make them break the church. That that will do it. There's still two more parts of this of this series, message series. So don't miss it. Don't miss it. And on Wednesday night, we're going through the book of Colossians. We're talking about the culture and how the culture. Uh, is starting to affect the church, but we need to have the church affect the culture. Colossians is a great book that teaches us a lot about that. So Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, be here. If you want to hit that, if you can't be here, we, we stream everything on Facebook Live. Get on Facebook, watch us. I know sometimes people got to work or things come up. I understand that. But be a seeker. Feed yourself. Feed yourself all week long. Pray. Read your Bible. Get filled up with the things of God so that then you can come and pour it out on people. You need it. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming. It's a real pleasure. Uh, it's a pleasure to see each and every one of you here. Please remember if you want to be involved in our uh, Celebrate Recovery, please get with me. we got plenty. We got plenty of things that we need help with, and we need every, this is an all-hands-on-deck kind of mission. We need everybody, so please you may think, well, I don't know what I can do. I promise you there's something you can do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray a, prayer, a blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Watch over us as we depart. Keep us safe all this week long. Help us to be a voice for you, your hands and feet. Bring us back to the next point in time, ready to worship and serve you with all of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Shake hands. Be friendly, guys. You're dismissed. Hope to see you again Wednesday or Sunday.